Today is this Tuesday, April 6, 2022, and it's 8 o'clock, so we're going to start. Commission Secretary, would you please call the roll? Here. 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 Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I have a friendly reminder that uh, for us today that we're continuing to live stream our open meetings for the public view from their home and office. If you're speaking, please make sure you speak into the microphone and the microphone is on so the viewers may hear you. We're going to start our meeting this morning with a brief safety emphasis. Bill Gross, Senior Safety Specialist, is going to share with us this morning. Bill? And I've already told Bill this. He is the best dressed safety presentation we've had since I've been here. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Um, I am here to give you your safety briefing this morning. Uh, in the event of a fire, the commission director and commission secretary will exit the rear of the room and out the back door in conference room 101 to the sidewalk on Jefferson Street. Uh, the audience will exit through the doors to the lobby uh, out the back of the building entrance to the back loading dock, and then we'll proceed to the sidewalk on Jefferson Street. An alternate exit is down the stairs and out through the main entrance. Please walk up the hill on Jefferson Street until everyone is safely out the back of the build or out of the back parking lot and a safe distance from the building and emergency response vehicles. In case there is a small fire, there is a fire extinguisher in the rear corner of the room uh, by the AV podium. I have asked Marty to retrieve and use the fire extinguisher in need. In the event of a severe weather, everyone should head to the center stairwell and go down as far as possible. If we must evacuate this room, please take a moment to make a note of who you are sitting next to and make sure that upon your arrival to the designated location that your neighbor has safely arrived with you. If there is a medical emergency, most people in this room are certified in CPR. Uh, Mark will call 911 and direct the emergency responders to our location at 105 West Capitol Avenue. Eric has volunteered to administer CPR and Becky will assist if necessary. There is an AED in the hallway on this floor across from conference room 103 and Paula will retrieve the AED in the event of a medical emergency. Uh, this may be a sensitive subject, but one we must discuss. I want to bring to your attention what to do if there is an intruder or an active shooter. There are three basic principles to follow. In the case of an active shooter, you run, hide, and fight. Run and escape if possible. Get away from the shooter or shooters is the top priority. Hide if escape is not possible. If you cannot exit the building, find a safe place to hide. Try to barricade the doors. Mark, uh, make yourself safe by turning off your cell phone and turning the lights off in the room. Uh, fight as an absolute last resort. Throw items, improvise weapons like chairs, fire extinguishers, and books to distract and disarm the shooter. This concludes today's safety meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Next, I'm going to review a few procedural items. I want to remind everyone that we have a public comment period, and we're pleased to offer this to every Missourian that wants to come before the commission to address an issue or of concern. If you'd like to address the commission, please sign up by 8.30 this morning. A reminder, you'll have five minutes for public comment and 10 minutes per subject. Next, I'll review our abstention process. There are commissioners that, because of land ownership or business interest, our lawyers may represent clients that may either have some relationship to a matter coming before the commission and may have potential actual conflict of interest. 
to be considered or voted on. The commission member will indicate if he or she chooses to abstain from voting to or to recuse himself from participating in an agenda item. If an agenda item is divisible by contract, call, project, or like, the commissioner may specify that particular matter and then still vote on the remainder agenda items. This information provided to the commission secretary by letter in advance of the meeting. The commission secretary will duly indicate abstentions, recusals, and according to in the minutes, Madam Secretary, have these letters been prepared? Great. The first item of business on the agenda today is consideration of minutes from the regular meeting of March 1st and a special meeting on February 28th. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Move we approve the minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. Favor, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Consideration for um, items on the consent agenda. Items removed from the consent agenda will be discussed under items removed for the consent agenda below. All items not removed from that agenda will be approved without discussion. Abstentions, the commissioner may abstain from voting on any item of consent agenda without removing it by specifying the item his desire to abstain. Does anyone need to remove or add to the consent agenda? Move we approve your consent agenda. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. The next order of business is to receive committee reports and board reports. I serve as the chair of the audit committee and the commissioners Briscoe and Ecker also serve on that committee. I'll give today's report because we have one. The audit committee met yesterday and we reviewed and accepted one internal audit report, which was the review of design consultant selection process. The next meeting is June 6th. Commissioners Briscoe and I serve as co-chairs of the legislative committee and I'll give today's report. As the General Assembly enters its sixth week of the 2022 legislative section, I'd like to focus this morning on a few problematic transportation related measures as part of this committee report. These are that the legislation has re, um, created a one time six month tax holiday for motor fuel sales tax. Uh, they've also um, made legislation to repeal the 12 and a half cent fuel tax per gallon, which was passed last year. They have legislation to change the Constitution to modify provisions relating to the appropriation of highway funds by the General Assembly, and they have legislation to change the Constitution's calculation of the total state revenues to them by including the highway funds, then subjecting those funds to the Hancock refunds. These proposed changes to the statute and state constitution can mean less funding available, for future roads and bridges. These changes to public policy could also reduce and the flexibility that the commission has to spend those resources based on our planning partners' needs. These legislative measures have been filed this year for two main reasons. The first is the misunderstanding and the impression that Missouri is now flush with federal funds. Between the recent passage of the next Trans Transportation Reauthorization Act, entitled Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the remaining COVID funds, legislators have seen billions of dollars. The second misunderstanding is that some elected officials pertaining to the Commission's filing of the de declaratory judgment against the Office of Administration and the Commission's authority to appropriate state road funds as it deems appropriate. Fortunately, these bills have not passed the House and still need the Senate approval. However, these proposals do propose real threats to the current structure and operations of commissions, farm and impact and delivery of road and bridge projects and identifying by our planning agencies across the state. We take this very seriously. We will continue to engage in conversations with the bill sponsors and the House and Senate leadership as it impacts these proposed changes we'll have on 
the distribution of funds and the authority of the Missouri Highway and Transportation Commission. On another note, I'm happy to report that a version of the commission's MoDOT legislative, legislative priority to promote safety by disallowing drivers of all ages from using an electronic wireless communication device while driving a motor vehicle has been heard in the House last week. House Transportation Committee Chairman Jeff Porter uh, has filed uh, House Bill 1487. This bill creates the traffic offense of distracted driving, which involves operating a commercial or non-commercial motor vehicle or school bus while using an electronic wireless communication device unless it's being used for navigation purposes. As safety advocates, we are excited to see that a version of this legislation has been heard in both the House and the Senate this session and will continue to work with the hands-free Missouri in advance of this legislation across the finish line this year. Finally, Patrick will have a little more to talk about this uh, activities of this legislative session, including the budget updating during his director's report. This concludes the legislative committee report. Commissioner Smith serves as president of the MTFC and Commissioners Water and Commissioner Eckert are board members. Commissioner Smith will provide the report for you today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's no report today. Our next meeting is in May. So we'll okay. have a report next month. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, Boatwright, and I serve on Epper's board today. Commissioner Boatwright will provide the report. Mr. Chairman, uh, today we have no report. Uh, we do have a governance committee meeting today, and then our next board meeting is April the 29th. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. As chairman, I serve on the Missouri Coalition of Road Safety and Executive Committee, and we will provide that report today. Uh, we met yesterday. We had a full agenda and heard presentations on each of the four emphasized areas of the Show Me Zero plan and that is occupant protection, distracted driving, speed and aggressive driving, and impaired driving. We had really some nice presentations. Uh, first was from uh, AAA, the Missouri State Highway Patrol, Kansas City Police Department, and we have a media consultant, uh, the Bucket Agency, and some MoDOT. The Bucket Agency is like Bucket List. Um, I want to give thanks to the State Highway Patrol and the other local law enforcement agencies that were there yesterday, uh, kicking off an uh, educational and enforcement effort that focuses on high crash corridors in both St. Louis and Kansas City regions. These Show Me Zero Safety Corridors are going to help raise awareness to the issues and hopefully minimize the prevalence of risky driving behaviors occurring on Missouri uh, roadways. And that was a really cool presentation. They've got uh, those corridors uh, figured out where all the high speeding and, and uh, the problems have been, so look out. We're pleased to hear about the coalition's efforts to revise our paid media marketing strategy and increase brand awareness for the Show Me Zero, and more importantly, to help Missourians recall the plans for key messages of buckle up, phone down, slow down, drive sober. Finally, we discussed legislative priorities for the coalition and noted for strengthening the state's public policy regarding highway safety. We're pleased that legislation designed to prohibit distracted driving and receive a hearing in both chambers of the state legislature. We're hoping the issue will be taken up uh, for discussion on the floor in the next few weeks. Our next committee meeting will be on September 27th in Columbia in conjunction with the 2022 Show Me Zero Statewide Conference. This concludes my report. The next item on the agenda is the director's report. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, I appreciate your your report, uh, the legislative report, uh, Mr. Chairman, talking about the, the potential impact of uh, legislation and budget actions. Uh, I, I think what you correctly characterize as a misunderstanding about the availability of federal funds or, or a mischaracterization, one of, one of the two. Uh, and essentially, when the um, federal bill 
was passed, the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed back in November, uh, it was it was probably portrayed as new money, new money coming uh, to all states around the country. And it was a incredibly important um, piece of legislation at the national level, one that we have worked tirelessly at um, as an agency through our national association for the last several years. And the setup of that bill, the basic construct of the things that we work on as owner operators on this system uh, for the road and bridge network is essentially a reauthorization of the surface transportation bill. It's a routine action by Congress that has to be done every five or six years to keep the nation's surface transportation system funded and operating. And um, vitally important, it provides a, a multi-year funding stability for an agency like ours that has to plan out complicated projects that uh, last more than a single year in construction, along with the basic core uh, maintenance and preservation activities that we fund. Um, at this commission's direction, more than two years ago, this commission instructed the department to go to all corners of the state to leverage the relationships that exist, that have been built and sustained uh, and nurtured over decades here in Missouri at the local level with our planning partners, regional planning commissions, metropolitan planning organizations, uh, and the transportation advisory committees that are made up of, uh, of community leaders all over the state, over 1,200 volunteers that gather together to consider the economic issues in their region, in their localities, in their communities, um, and to to decide what the priorities for transportation investments should be. The commission was not satisfied with the department's ability to um, capture what we weren't getting to. Uh, we were doing our job with the federal requirements to create a five-year capital plan updated each year, the statewide transportation improvement program. And we have done so dutifully, but the requirement on the federal side of that is that it must be fiscally constrained. We must only place in for construction those projects that we have a reasonable assurance that we can fund over that five-year period. And because of that requirement, we were, I think, uh, lulled into a sense of satisfaction that we were doing our job. This commission, and this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important that the public understands why it's so important to have authority that's been vested by the citizens of Missouri through the Constitution and this commission, um, unsatisfied with us just doing our job, but to find out what we weren't getting to that communities need desperately because of decades of underfunding on, on transportation. So the unfunded needs process began. Uh, we spent two years uh, updating this, and in fact, the, the, the um, interim updates that we brought to the commission for your consideration in the last couple of years were um, so popular in their approach that we were listening and hearing what community needs are, recording that, tabulating it, and presenting it as what we needed to get to for additional investment that you have instructed through official commission policy, the um, repeated update of that process as part of our annual uh, capital planning process. And in doing so, we identified over $10 billion of unfunded needs beyond the $5 billion current statewide transportation improvement program. The, the ability to identify those needs came at the perfect time when availability of federal funds and with the, the governor's and the general assembly's movement to um, bring a gas tax increase forward for the state. So in doing so, we were able to, in our preliminary planning process for this year's STIP, update and pull in almost 25% of the unfunded needs um, that had been identified previously to build our capital program. We had that going when the ink wasn't even dry on that federal bill. We had it going to commit all the funds of the increase in the state gas tax um, to be able to match those federal funds and maximize that capital program. In our estimation, uh, our capital program this year, when you consider all aspects, including uh, the engineering costs, is about $9 billion. 
It's a 52% increase over current levels. And it's an extraordinary body of work and, and needs that are going to be met in this state. And to, to see an incursion into that process by misguided policy um, for either repeal of the fuel tax or uh, gas tax holiday. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to um, argue the intent. Uh, inflation is high, costs are high for families. But, you know, consider the legislature in their wisdom last year baked in a rebate process into the fuel tax to have families that are struggling an ability to receive that money back. And for those that aren't, chip in so that we can improve this system. The impact that the commissioner, that the chairman talked about on these proposals could impact that, um, that multi-billion dollar plant by about 3.6 billion, $3.6 billion. Um, that will be pulling away from projects that we've identified for funding in this next five years. That's the impact. That is hundreds of projects and improvements that are necessary um, to just bring our system to where it should be um, and, and then to build um, the ability to improve it. So it's, it's very important, I think, that we set the table square on what the impact is uh, and that we discuss this publicly because uh, uninformed or misguided uh, policy moves could do great damage um, to our ability to make progress and could bring us back to a level that's below our current capital level, because it will also put in jeopardy um, the ability to go to the capital markets and to, to really um, uh, to leverage at, a, at a, an appropriate time to maximize that capital program. So I want to thank the commission for your leadership um, in directing the organization to calculate, to work with communities across the state and to, and to document the unfunded needs, because I think that that presents this um, really fertile ground for what additional funds can do in an in a impact level for um, citizens across the state and for the communities that we serve. So thank you for that leadership. And uh, I think it's one of the best processes we've gone through. I found it very rewarding. And um, in our partners were extraordinary in their uh, the, these are not boondoggle projects. Our partners came with the, what the needs were. Um, and, you know, you look at from each region of the state and the work that our team did at MoDOT, our district engineers, our planning department, um, our design folks, the, the entire organization came together to, to put this out. Uh, and we just need to hold ground and move forward. And, and I know we can do that. There's, there's just a few weeks left in, in, in the uh, session, and we're really pleased with um, you know, the, the rank and file uh, legislators who came to, um, came to the state capitol to assure that we would increase this investment in transportation have held their ground. And they've done a tremendous thing for the state of Missouri, and we hope that they will continue to do that through the remainder of the session. Uh, those, those impacts are real. Um, and we can avoid them. Uh, and your your comments about the constitutional issues, um, I, I think, stand well on their own. Uh, I support your your arguments there. Um, this constitutional authority that exists within the commission was granted by the citizens of Missouri through the Constitution. It wasn't taken. It was given. It's a responsibility, and it's been um, managed well over the hundred year history of the commission. And we believe for the next hundred years, it will as well. So I also want to mention um, one of the things uh, the commission has asked for uh, regular updates on our staffing issues, turnover, these things. Uh, we've just gone through the first quarter of the calendar year. And I'm uh, unfortunately, I have to report that we've had turnover of uh, over 250 people already in the first three months of the year have left employment at the department. That is uh, almost 100 people more than the same period last year. And last year was a record. We lost 831 people in the calendar year. So we are on pace um, to lose over 1,000 employees at MoDOT this year. Um, this is why the efforts that the commission has embarked on and, 
and uh, the efforts to bring forward a market adjustment is so critical uh, for the department on the cusp of being able to have the largest capital program in Missouri history. We're on a precipice. We're on. We're teetering uh, as an enterprise from a workforce uh, development area. All of our districts, all of our divisions are doing an extraordinary job keeping the work going um, during this period of unprecedented turnover. It's obviously been made um, more substantial uh, with the effects of the pandemic and and all of the things that are going on around the, the country and the globe. Um, but this added an, an exclamation to a, a multi-year problem uh, that we've been facing, and we have not been able to um, address adequately through the public policy process. And, and we're taking efforts to be able to do that. I appreciate the commission's leadership there as well. Uh, the, uh, and, and speaking of the pandemic, uh, just this past week, we, we, have, um, we have used what we believe to be a very data centric approach to our management through the pandemic over the last couple of years. Uh, and we were very heartened um, in the last month and a half to see a dramatic decline in the number of cases of COVID at MODA. That, that last variant strain that came through, as you recall, I reported um, uh, in the last couple of months that in the month of January, MODOT had 757 cases of COVID in our enterprise. Uh, so another challenge operationally to work through. Uh, we had put in place very early on uh, January a couple of years ago, uh, and it was actually about 750 days ago uh, that we um, implemented a provision in our, our continuity of operations plan uh, to create an incident command structure to address the issues related to the pandemic. Um, Becky Almaroth, our chief safety and operations officer, was, um, was uh, appointed as our incident commander, and she's done an extraordinary job. Uh, over these couple of years. I'd, I'd like to highlight for you um, some of her team, Chris Engelbrecht and, and Michael White, incredible experts in safety and emergency management. And we used um, very standard um, incident management and command structure um, management structures that were set up in each of our regions around our divisions. We had reporting structures to keep our ears to the ground. We um, operationalized changes across the department. Very complicated. We we kept that command structure and then also stood up a pandemic response team made up of leaders throughout our enterprise. We met regularly. In fact, um, early on, we were meeting daily, multiple times a day. Um, we have tapered that as the severity of the, of the issues have gone. And frankly, in the last 15 days, I'm very pleased to report we have not had a a single case of COVID in the in the department. Really, um, we're we're blessed to be in that in that position right now. Um, and so last week we scaled back our efforts and our reporting efforts and and others, uh, effectively trying to give time back to our folks that have been doing double time with this uh, activity. We're prepared to stand that back up if we need to, um, but we're going to let the data determine that. And and uh, so we've. Um, we've stood down um, most of our, we've suspended our pandemic response team. We've stood down most of our incident command structure other than monitoring um, the state and national efforts um, and, and uh, any type of new variant that might spread. Uh, you know, a couple of our other uh, team members, um, I'd, I'd mention um, Ashley Halford, uh, who's our health and safety, uh, health and wellness uh, manager. She's done an extraordinary job, her and her team. Um, Kim Hickey and Steve Maestrick uh, in Human Resources, extraordinary effort. And they represent literally hundreds of people that have, that have um, dealt with this. Uh, you know, this pandemic that we've been through is unlike anything any of us have seen in our lifetime. I, I think it's gonna leave an imprint on all of us, um, but it's also been an extraordinary period of service to the public. We kept the transportation system going. We had our biggest construction year in more than a decade um, through the efforts of our construction industry, our consultants that we work in partnership with, and the and the hard efforts uh, through MoDOT. So I'm, I'm really proud of the, the team 
and the work that we've done. And I, and I am so thrilled to move beyond um, the emergency period that we have been in and to give back um, on a management basis the time that people contributed. You know, all the people I mentioned are all on salary. Uh, they were doing double time uh, and have done an extraordinary job. So my, my hat's off to our team. And, uh, and I'm really pleased at where we are right now. Uh, we had the, um, the Leadership um, in Action Recognition Awards dinner last night, really pleased by that. Um, and it was so nice to have everybody together and, and uh, in fellowship. Uh, the, um, the month of April, uh, every, every month of April, we invite uh, all those who use Missouri roads to join us in doing some spring cleaning along our roadsides. We have this uh, No More um, uh, Trash Bash. It's an annual outreach uh, to our 5,300 Adopt-A-Highway volunteer groups to pick up their sections of uh, along the highway during the month. Um, but anyone can do that on a one-time basis. Uh, we've also uh, keyed up, we've keyed up internally some some uh, flexibility for our for our administrative team and and other folks to help out our maintenance uh, professionals to to get out there and and help clean up. Uh, the roadside. This year is the 35th anniversary of MoDOT's Adopt a Highway program. And I've asked uh, Chief Safety and Operations Officer Becky Almaroth to share more details on what MoDOT's doing to fight the litter problem on our roadsides. I appreciate that. And to kind of piggyback off to what the director was talking about, our staffing challenges, um, this time of year in particular, we have a lot more of those maintenance activities that fall into those higher priority categories. So all of our maintenance uh, activities fall into priorities one through four with those priority ones this time of year um, after winter operations of course being a priority one those potholes that start popping up the stop signs are knocked down uh, flooding this time of year making sure drains are clean um, all the way down to priority four which those priority four uh, litter falls into that category so not necessarily a danger to the traveling public unless it's in the lanes so it kind of falls on the back burner sometimes when we are dealing with staffing challenges. So in addition to our adopt a highway program and our no more trash bath during the month of April, um, it is exciting because we do have about 6,400 lane miles and over 50,000 volunteers that are out picking right now. Um, a lot of people get excited to see the flowers blooming. I get excited to see the yellow trash bags from our adopt a highway volunteers uh, this time of year. Um, but they adopt about 6,400 lane miles, but that's still a, quite a gap of our 34,000 lane miles that we have to pick. And they do provide a service of about a million dollars um, every year of litter picking. Um, but MoDOT, we spend about six million a year. So this really is a large activity, a large endeavor to keep those roadsides clean. Um, one of the things that we are doing, um, there's a, with the Adopt a Highway, each of the districts have some community events that are going on right now. Uh, we've had some radio stations, especially in our St. Louis district, that have been some of the most critical of the litter on the highway. And uh, we've joined forces with them to kind of partner on some of those community events, um, drawing large crowds, including MoDOT employees, to go pick on a Saturday. Um, really joining forces um, if it's a big concern and they're putting their money where their mouth is, it's very, very effective. Uh, one of the other things that we're trying this year, um, St. Louis and Kansas City districts where we have some of the largest staffing gaps, we're trying some litter only contracts. So contracts for litter, um, we had some estimates. This is new to the state of Missouri, so we didn't quite know how the estimates uh, and the bids would come in, but they came in very favorably. So in St. Louis, uh, the St. Louis litter contract was awarded to Strawn Farm uh, with an April notice to proceed, so they have started. Um, these are one-year contracts, but we have the option for renewals. Uh, they're gonna do 12 cycles, one per month, for a total of 44.5 center lane miles of litter picking. So uh, those, the contract amount ended up being $333,000 or about $625 per lane mile. Um, per cycle, but you got to think on these roads that we picked, which were Interstate 70, Interstate 44, Interstate 55, and Interstate 170. Uh, you're not only picking the road sides, but also picking the full median. So it's quite a bit of, of acreage that needs to be picked. Uh, for the St. Louis uh, side, uh, we do have a litter contract. We do have a lowest responsive bidder that they're getting ready to award to. 
Again, that will be a one-year contract. They're going to try um, two cycles or two per month for their contract. Uh, they had a base bid that had 39 centerline miles uh, with an ad alternate of 23 centerline miles that they're evaluating right now. Looks like they're likely to award the base bid with the ad alternates. Uh, that contract amount uh, with the ad alternate will be about 828,000 or 556 per lane mile per cycle. They are going to concentrate on Interstates 435, Interstate 70, Interstate 670, and US 61. And those alternates that they would like to add are Interstate 29, Interstate 35, and Interstate 49. One of the other big challenges that we've seen, we kind of knew um, the number of incarcerated crews that we were getting. Everything completely stopped because of COVID. And when we returned out of COVID, it didn't seem quite the way that it had been. We knew that our numbers of inmates that we were getting has greatly decreased. So Natalie Roark, our district, uh, or our state maintenance director, has been meeting with the Department of Corrections to find out why and see if we can return back to those inmate numbers that we had seen previously. Um, really interesting, and COVID had an effect on this, but they have seen a, de a significant decrease in the number of offenders that they have in our prisons. Uh, to put it in perspective, <laughs> but to put that into perspective, uh, pre-COVID or the summer of 2019, we utilized 74 incarcerated crews with 343 inmates. Uh, currently, we have 30 crews. So we went from 74 to 30, and we have 140 inmates. So we've seen a decrease of about 60%. And I can remember even looking back 10 years ago, we had over 600 um, incarcerated uh, prisoners that helped pick. So this is a big gap. So some of those things that we're doing with those litter only contracts, we have asked Natalie to look to see if that's a statewide option, see if there's a company large enough to take on something like that. And then the Kansas City District, we're also looking to pilot um, a contract to help with the homeless or the encampment cleanups. That's a big burden on our resources and some of the hazards that they need to clean up from those areas. We just don't want to put our workers in that situation. They're not properly trained for that. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. You know, when the minute we move from, from uh, out of the snow season, the first 70 degree weather day we get, um, it always seems to catch the attention of everybody driving on the roadways that there's been a winter full of uh, trash that's uh, collected. I just want to always remind people it's not mowed out out there littering, right? Um, we need we need the public's help. Uh, and think about it, uh, you're, you, the taxpayers of the state, are paying over $6 million uh, to pick up this litter, and that money could be better spent elsewhere if, uh, you know, in many cases, it's unsecured loads. Uh, I think there's been a decline of people just opening the window and throwing things out, but it's mostly unsecured loads um, and trash uh, moving from from those. So, you know, we just we always um, appreciate the public's patience as we as we shift from winter maintenance to uh, our spring and summer maintenance. It takes some time because, you know, this weather kept spitting at us, uh, you know, it'd be 70 degrees on Tuesdays and snow snowing on Thursdays. So. Um, uh, our team is doing the best we can. Um, it is a constant um, customer service concern that we receive, and we we take those seriously, and we're we're on it. So, uh, 
You know, I, I also wanted to mention uh, back on March 17th, we had a multi-vehicle incident, more than a multi-vehicle incident, uh, about 50 vehicles on Interstate 57 in Mississippi County uh, during the morning rush hour. Uh, this amounted to over a 20-hour closure of uh, I-57, uh, which is pretty extraordinary uh, time. Uh, just shows you the severity of the incident. Um, but there was an incredible response uh, by, um, by multiple levels of government agencies. Um, unfortunately, uh, coroners uh, also, because there were, uh, there were five fatalities in that event. Um, but the, the cleanup and the work that was done uh, was extraordinary. Uh, and in a week after this uh, crash, we had a recognition event. Uh, Mark Corkin, uh, our, our district engineer from the Southeast, did a really great job, him and his team, putting this event together. Um, we had over 180 first responders at that event um, at, our, at our district office in Sykeston. Lieutenant Governor Kehoe uh, graced us with his presence. He was, he was terrific to be there. Uh, Commissioner Boatwright was able to, uh, to join us as well and came and thanked the group. I want to thank Commissioner Boatwright for, for um, sharing in that and for thanking our team. And uh, we have a video of the event that we'd like to show. So thank you all for coming. I'm Mark Corkin. I'm MoDOT Southeast District Engineer. Um, I look out in front, front of me at all the people and I think, wow, you know, I'm looking at workers, I'm looking at responders, I'm looking at managers, employees, people that came together and helped, you know, last Thursday when we had a horrible incident, you know, about as horrible incident as I can imagine. And there was an awful lot of teamwork that I appreciate. Yeah, I want to say thanks to each and every one of you. But before we get to recognition, I, I've got to think a little bit about the people that lost their lives. You know, we had five people that weren't so lucky in this incident. And um, one of them I would call a friend. You know, I, um, I knew Bill Ryan. He actually worked at MoDOT for 37 years in St. St. Louis. So when he retired from MoDOT, he went to work for DNS Fence and he'd started his own company and I know he had plans this week, next week and beyond that he's not gonna be able to fulfill. So I'd, I'd like to start off, just take a moment of silence. If you'd bow your head and maybe say thanks for the people that are here and a little blessing for the families of those that aren't. I am so excited that all of you showed up, but I'm even more excited to get to introduce the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Missouri, Mike Kehoe. I wanted to come by personally to make sure you realize that um, when you have an unfortunate incident like we had last week, you see Missouri's best come out. And I know we had a little help from some of our friends in some of the neighboring states, uh, but the coordination that we saw between state departments, local municipalities, county officials, sheriff's departments, um, that's what makes Missouri proud. The loss of life, to Mark's point, is incredibly sad. Uh, after you guys witnessed what you did, I'm sure some of you thought it could have actually been worse. Uh, but when we get a corridor like that with 47 vehicles over a half mile stretch and 20 hours, up to 20 hours closure in some directions, um, digging all that, getting that unwound, crime scenes, accident scenes, all the things that happened, uh, takes the coordination of a lot of people. And I just want to, I'm here to say thank you to that. Like I said, I know we have a lot of our friends from cooperating agencies from Charleston, Mississippi County and New Madrid County and EMS workers and firefighters, sheriff's departments and other folks that will be thanked at the appropriate time by the appropriate person, uh, as well as obviously highway department folks that will come thanks later. Uh, so I'm not overlooking any of those. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you understand that what you do is appreciated and what you do is what makes the state great. Because what I tell people all the time, it's never elected officials, including me and any others that are here, God love you. It's the people of the state that make the state great. And it's the people in this room 
that really shine the brightest when time in need. And you really outshine the brightest of shine. So thank you so much. God bless each and every one of you. Thank each and every one of you for coming together and um, really making a difference last week. Tough situation. And um, it was chaotic. And you did a wonderful job. The folks that I want to uh, specifically uh, have you stand as I, as I call out the different uh, MoDOT buildings, uh, just please stand up and stay standing because we want to recognize each and every one of you. Uh, the Charleston uh, Maintenance Facility, you can go ahead and stand up. Sykeston, Dexter, Advance, Cape Girardeau, Puxico, Kennett, Popper Bluff, Kewlin, Malden, and Kiwani. So these are the folks, uh, I mean, most of the folks in the room know exactly where those areas are. I mean, that's folks from uh, pretty widespread coming together at one location and uh, re really making a difference for the state. It's a lifetime of dedication of service uh, that enabled you to respond to help save lives, uh, to make sure that we kept other people safe uh, during that event. 20 hour duration, multiple shifts, uh, people that didn't want to leave, uh, that got relieved uh, so that you could be safe as well. Uh, it's just an incredible uh, thing to see so many um, so many public servants serving the public so well and in coordination uh, in many cases, uh, areas and, and folks that hadn't worked together before just, just came in and did their jobs. Uh, I, I do want to recognize uh, a couple of the MoDOT employees that um, in, in particular. First is uh, Kirby Woods. Uh, he's our senior construction inspector. He found himself in the middle of the multi-vehicle crash as he was on his commute to work. Um, Kirby, uh, Kirby actively sought to rescue and retrieve those involved in the accident while initiating and maintaining communications in, perfect, uh, in, in person and on phone to respond and to coordinate the efforts of many first responding agents including MoDOT. He was the first responder on the scene. He also provided detailed firsthand awareness to 911 uh, of the full magnitude of the scene. That valuable information got all the right resources headed to the scene within seconds. Uh, that quick action, you know, a lot of people drive by these things. We see it all the time. People that work in agencies that provide service and have training uh, don't drive by and let people uh, be kept on the hook. Uh, Kirby, for your actions uh, and all that followed and all the people that followed and the fact that they got there fast, um, that saved lives. Thank you. Would you please stand and be recognized? Thanks. Thank you. This is uh, Jason. Uh, he's a maintenance supervisor at the Charleston Maintenance uh, Facility. He mobilized his crews for immediate response to the um, to the incident that was in proximity to, the, to his facility. He continued to direct MoDOT crews within the accident scene to ensure coordination of efforts and collaboration with other with other agencies. You know, under under these extreme events, and and would you please stand, Jason, and be recognized as well? Thank you. Really appreciate everybody being here today and for the work that you do. You know, Mr. Chairman, we have um, Senior Construction Inspector Kirby Woods is uh, with us today, and I, I'd ask Kirby to come forward and, and be recognized so that we can present him with the Mer Meritorious uh, Safety Award for your quick thinking and for your situational awareness. Thank you for your for your efforts, they saved, they did save lives.
you know, with with these types of events and everything, it's I, I just want to say thank you to our communications team, um, to our uh, to our IS team. They're always on the spot. They're here uh, today, and it, just to show you just how good they are, they staged that event and planned it out, and got one of uh, our our local commissioner to pronounce all of the local shed names uh, in a way that wouldn't be offensive if I did it and botched it all. So, you know, just, and, and nobody even said anything about that, but when it was done, I was like, oh boy, they are clever. Because they knew I would have I, I would have messed it all up. So you don't have the accent for it. I don't, I don't. I'm trying, but it's just not coming fast enough, right? So, uh, you know, this month I, I have another great story to share and another award to present. We have, um, Actually, uh, one of uh, two employees from the Warrensburg Maintenance uh, uh, Building in Kansas City, two of them are receiving the award. Um, on February 4th, maintenance crew leader uh, Matt Rauner, who could not be with us uh, today, um, he had a, an emergency to deal with, uh, and uh, senior maintenance worker Clayton Hamlin, uh, were driving back to their building at 1 a.m. after working a snowstorm. They saw a woman sitting on the ledge of the Highway 13 bridge um, o o over Highway 50. They called 911. They tried to talk to her, but she wouldn't respond to them. Uh, when the first Warrensburg police officer arrived, the woman started scooting off the edge of the bridge uh, and Clayton and Matt grabbed her so she wouldn't fall, fall off. Um, you know, uh, Clayton told me when she saw the police, she let go and they, they grabbed her. They, they were able to um, keep her from falling. Um, she resisted the help from them and the, the officer, but uh, Clayton and Matt helped the officer keep her safe until another police officer arrived. And it was only about 10 degrees that, that night and they were coming off a shift. Um, they turned direction and came back to, uh, um, to what became a, a life-saving uh, action. Uh, on, on February 28th, Clayton and Matt were presented uh, the life-saving award from the Warrensburg City Council and uh, I'm honored to present um, our meritorious safety award uh, to Clayton, who's here, and uh, we'll we'll get Matt his uh, as well uh, for their brave act that saved this woman's life. So please join us. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Just an amazing team we have, yeah, and, it uh, is. and it is unbelievable, unbelievable actions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have left you a little behind on your agenda. My apologies. That concludes my report. It's quite all right. It was well worth it. <laughs> Any discussion regarding Patrick's report? Patrick, thank you. I'm still amazed. Ever seems like every month we have something like this come up, and the way that uh, people just react instantly and do the right thing and uh, it, it kind of leaves you speechless, doesn't it? But uh, thank you for all you guys, what you do and the way that our folks are out there touching people, you know, that's what we do. So good work. Thank you, Commissioner Waters. Next item on the agenda is an action item 
Travis Kustner, State Design Engineer, will present the bids for our consideration. Good morning, Chairman Rinkman, uh, Commissioners, Director McKenna. I'm here to present the results of the March 18th, 2022 bid opening. Where Modet received 73 bids on uh, 23 calls. We recommend the following to you today, and that's to award all the calls to the lowest responsive bidder. So pretty short and sweet. That's it. <laughs> It was. You're, recommend to award all calls. Yeah. You're getting us right back on the schedule. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Travis? I move we approve the bids quickly. Yeah. <laughs> then move and second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Um, and do you have a budget update for us? Uh, yes, I do. For uh, focus on bridges, we're uh, we're at around 230. We're at 237 bridges, and we're nine million dollars over budget. So still pretty good with that program. Overall, this gets us to over a billion dollars worth of work for the fiscal year, which is a good, it's a great milestone to get over a billion dollars. We uh, we did not do that last year, and we're going to see this amount plus a lot more as we move forward. And we're still running about right at the inflation rate over program. We're about $77.3 million over our program amount, which is 7.4%. So the, still seeing those market effects. Yeah, great. Any other comments? Yeah. Yes, Bo, Mr. Right. Chairman. Travis, thank you. Yeah. Um, you, you know, this the focus on bridge program to see those go out the door uh, and, and starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel on them. Wow. It's certainly exciting. We appreciate you and everything your team does. So thank you. Yeah, the districts and bridge division, we you know we we process all the all the hard work that all those divisions do, and they're doing a great job getting that getting those bridges going. So great. Patrick, do you have any comments? I want to keep you on schedule. Okay. <laughs> We and we appreciate that. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a non action item, and I think Travis is uh, going to present with Ashley Becker. Yep, I'll, I'll remain up here and I'll invite the assistant state design engineer Brenda Harris, assistant state design engineers, will present the design division for the night. And you're starting this. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, we uh, kind of look back and we have not done a design division update that we have uh, seen for a long time. You know, I know you get updates from the districts in many divisions. So we're uh, we're excited to be able to present an update for the uh, full design division. And I have Ashley and Brenda here to help me today. Uh, and uh, I was planning on turning this over to all three division assistant division engineers, but in true uh, public service, uh, Kenny Voss, uh, uh, assistant state design engineer, is uh, chaperoning a high school band trip, and they left today for Florida. So I don't know. So I think he'll uh, he'll have his hands full with that. But um, so we're going to give you a really quick update of design division. I'll kind of do Kenny's part uh, for this. You know, we really have eight separate kind of functions in design division from computer aided draft design, right away, outdoor advertising, engineering policy, consultant services, contract services, local programs and environmental. So kind of all those areas wrap up with the uh, with the target of 85 staff members for the division. We're a little uh, we're a little short on that now. We're just uh, missing a couple, thank goodness. By April fifteenth, we should be with eighty three of eighty five. We have a couple engineer spots that we're you know really having trouble filling, just like the rest of the uh, rest of the uh, state has. They are our areas are pretty uh, singularly focused. So you know even though we're just down two spots, you know everybody else is doing a great job filling in those specific functions of those uh, those couple jobs. So. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of a few areas, then turn it over to Ashley and then Brenda to wrap it up. But uh, really for uh, project delivery, want to cover uh, really just the staffing and the areas that we have. We uh, main focus here were to work in union with the districts as they do the jobs and actually to support them in engineering functions, consulting functions, anything that they need to do to keep the jobs going. So with this, just like to highlight, we have four uh, full-time liaison engineers. That includes our design build support engineer and one 1,000 hour engineer. And all these uh, all these staff members have over 15 years of service and a lot of experience. And they really help the districts with any type of engineering issue to keep developing the projects and get them to uh, fruition to the uh, to the final uh, final result of the award that we just mentioned. So they help with things like uh, contracting types of uh, IDIQ, JOCs. They help with agreements with other states, with uh, cities and counties. They help uh, shepherd that, that process through with the district project managers and the district design staff. 
Um, over this past year, this staff also helped with the 95 value engineering studies on the design side and 25 on the construction side. So they, uh, their job is to kind of take that and share that information district-wide with the other districts and also with our engineering policy group to keep that information going. And uh, just to highlight for design build, our uh, Dave has his hands full. We have uh, six active design build projects now worth about $819 million, you know, and, uh, and wow. a few more coming, coming down the pipeline as well. So with that, we'll move on to our environmental staff. So uh, this is the one unit that we wholly house in central office. And this is a team of 29 individuals. And uh, these really aren't engineers or technicians or archaeologists, biologists, environmental scientists. So uh, you can kind of see they work they have done over the past year uh, to stay in co compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act. So this is working with all those other different agencies. I uh, We actually just had an interagency meeting yesterday with uh, Natural Resources, Conservation, SEMA, Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, EPA. They all, they all came together for in-person meeting, the first one since COVID. And it's really good that those groups can get together because they all see the uh, the amount of work that's on the horizon with all the additional uh, state and federal funding. So it's good that we all work in unison with them. Um, uh, they they also have uh, that, that SHPO letter. SHPO stands for the State Historic Preservation Office. So that's all the archaeology ar archaeologists and the uh, the historic building and facilities that we uh, preserve as we're doing jobs as well. Um, in the pictures there, I, I, I always, uh, these, these folks, I, I kind of joke around, we probably have the most uh, master's degree folks per unit of any unit in the state here because these folks are passionate about what they do and they they, they love doing it because they get they get to actually do the field work and the actually permitting work um you see a stream and mussel survey uh, that those mussels are an endangered species so that's actually our staff out there in the in the stream identifying and finding those species so we can uh, meet the requirements for the mitigation of those uh, those species. Also, you see some of our archaeologists doing a dig to do a clearance for a mitigation for a construction site. And at the bottom, we also have hazardous waste specialists. So they take care of any hazardous waste issues on MoDOT property. This includes uh, anything that a crash along the right of way. They work in conjunction with the districts and Department of Natural Resources. But uh, here's just a photo of one of our uh, staff doing a uh, maintenance facility inspection to make sure that uh, we're, we're in compliance for has waste with the, with the fuel and everything we have at those facilities. So next up is uh, consultant services. So this is also uh, one of those areas under Kenny's group. Uh, we, this really has not been a full-time job for any person until April 15th. We are adding a staff member called a professional services coordinator, a business degree type staff member to help shepherd this process through. And we think this is really important with the increased program our consultant budget's going up. You know, it wasn't that many years ago, our consultant budget was around 30, 40 million. By, uh, by fiscal year 24, 25, we're gonna be at right at $100 million per year for consultant budget. So uh, with that amount of work that comes in of soliciting consultants, administering the contracts, and keeping track of all of that, we thought it was uh, important to have someone fully in charge of that and to work with one of the data analysts that we have. As you can see, we also uh, shepherd the, uh, the uh, consultant contracts for the LPA local program as well as they come through. So, uh, so that's uh, that's a pretty good a uh, pretty good job that we have to uh, keep track of. In that picture there, you also see uh, there's one of our liaisons working with our uh, owners consultant and our district staff as uh, for a risk assessment for actually the Chester Bridge, I believe, is what that picture is there. So, uh, they they uh, they we we get out and about and uh, and move around quite a bit. So. Um, Here's the uh, the contract services division. This is the last area I'm going to cover before I turn it over to uh, to Ashley. But uh, this is a staff of 11. So what this group does, they take the uh, plan specifications and estimate from the uh, districts, from the project managers in the districts, or from our uh, our bridge design. So they take those plans and those uh, job special provisions. They actually create the proposals that are bid on every month. They advertise those jobs. We have a staff of three folks that prepare the final engineer's estimate. You know, that's uh, by uh, by law, that's our uh, that's our benchmark for how we can decide to award or reject jobs, that final engineer estimate. And they do a combination of uh, historical and cost best estimating to do that. But, you know, with uh, with three estimators and the amount of jobs we do, they they don't have a lot of time to spend on them. We also conduct then the monthly bid openings. So that's all hands on deck for the monthly bid openings. Uh, I think Aisha is going to give an EAC update later. She's our transportation data analyst that works with all of the electronic bids that comes in and feeds all that information to the review and estimating staff. 
then after that, we do the bid analysis so they can uh, report their recommendations and we can uh, chat about it with executive staff before we bring those bids recommendations to uh, to the commission each month. And also uh, after, as soon as I sit down from this, I'll be sending them a, an email or a text because you just awarded that set of jobs. They'll begin working on the uh, contract creation for this month. So they develop all the contracts and send them out to all the contractors for them to execute and all the other legal aspects of that. I mean, if there's a, with the bonds and everything else. And then also the reporting aspect, you know, they work with the, the financial services group and a lot of folks to make sure we, uh, we keep track of all that, uh, that reporting aspect of things that go through. So, so with that, I'm going to uh, switch gears here and turn it over to uh, Ashley to cover the local program. Thank you, Travis. And as Travis mentioned, I'm Ashley Booster. I'm a the assistant state design engineer with a focus on the LPA program. And I'm going to be covering what services the district or the design division offers in, in regards to district support. And I'll start with local programs. So first off, in this regard, local stands for our cities and our counties. And at the design division actually provides guidance to those LPAs, those local public agencies. So Basically, what we do is anytime that there's a city in the county that has a project that's using federal funds, we want to make sure that that money is flowing through them and that they're following all the rules appropriately. So we provide guidance and support to those LPAs. And within the design division, the local programs team is a team of four. Um, however, there are approximately 40 to 50 district members that also help support that LPA program across the state. So that varies from full-time em employees, also to temporary part-time employees across the state that help support that program. And for example, um, in fiscal year 2021, the LPA team um, had concurrence and award for 141 construction, 141 construction projects with a total contract value of about 115 million. So then the next area is engineering policy. So the engineering policy group, they provide support for our standard plans our standard specifications, the engineering policy guide, which is known as the EPG, job special provisions and proprietary item approvals. So all of these documents are available external and a lot of our partners rely on those documents. So it's key that we keep them up to date and make sure that they're ready, readily available to our external partners. Our, uh, within the design division, the engineering team consists of five, five people within the design division that oversee those, those documents. And for example, the, the, the EPG, there's over 905 pages in the EPG and 612 categories. In February of 2022, um, there were over 28,000 separate viewers to the EPG. And since 2015, we've had over 1,600 revisions to the EPG as well. So as I mentioned, those documents, especially the EPG, are available to our external partners. And it's key that we keep those up to date so everybody has the most up-to-date and current information. Are the external partners requesting those changes? Sometimes, yep. Um, some of them come internally. Some do come from our external partners. Um, but yeah, often our external partners will identify something and communicate right. with our internal staff. Cool. Yep. The next area is CAD and engineering software. So CAD stands for Computer Aided Design and Drafting. And that group, they provide software and training, essentially support to the CAD software, the design software that our designers are using, the software that our surveyors are using, and also GIS, which is Geospatial Information systems. Um, the CAD group also does photography and LIDAR deliverables. So LIDAR is, for example, is basically the replica of the Earth's surface. So our designers can do the appropriate design um, necessary. And the CAD group in 2021, the, they oversee that LIDAR program, which was about $2.7 million, which equates to 12 projects and 70 miles. So we actually hire that work out to a consultant to fly and um, produce our LIDAR deliverables for our designers. Uh, the CAD group also oversees MoDOT statewide GPS real-time network. So this is a network that's free to external partners, so no cost. We have a lot of surveyors, farmers, construction firms, law enforcement that use this network. And statewide, we have 82 stations currently part of that network. 
And the CAD team within the design division is currently um, 11 people. And then another big part that the design division does is oversee training or provide training for our um, internal partners or internal staff and external partners actually. And some of those examples of the training that we do provide. So we provide an LPA basic training. So in calendar year 2021, about 462 people took that training and that is LPAs, consultants, MoDOT staff, Federal Highway. But any LPA that is doing a project that's receiving those federal funds, they're required to take this training. Um, so in 2021, we, we provided that to 462 people. And then in CAD training, you can kind of see the numbers here for 2019. 2020, we didn't do any CAD training um, since, of, since COVID. 2021, our numbers are starting to come back up. In 2022, we have completed three in-person trainings, but there's definitely more scheduled this calendar year. And then overall program delivery or the design division offers a variety of trainings um, internally. And in fiscal year 2021, we, we've delivered 11 new program delivery training webinars. But of all the training that the program delivery and design division offers, there's already been completed almost 30,000 hours of training completed statewide. So with that, I will turn it over to Brenda. Good morning, I'm Brenda Harris. I'm the assistant to state design engineer for right of way. I take care of the right of way section for the state as well as outdoor advertising. I'm going to talk about system management and various areas under system management. The first one is technology. And MoDOT's continued effort in improving technology provides an electronic system that works with an electronic filing system. It also helps us to maintain documents and archives that are required by state statute, and it's a huge program. Um, technology is also the key that has allowed us to um, be so successful during the COVID environment where everyone was working from home. And um, some of the things that we've used on a regular basis is e-projects, e-agreements, right-of-way applications, and as-built plans archives. All of these centralized web-based systems are, work, are available to MoDOT staff um, only. The next area is right-of-way. Right-of-way provides guidance, support, and oversight to the districts. Here in central office, we are the um, go-betweens between the locals and federal highway, other governmental agencies. We also assist the LPAs. We make sure that they are in compliance with the rules and the regulations. Um, in central office, there are four right-of-way staff members that manage the entire state and help with obligations and project support. And in the districts, there are 50 to 55 right-of-way staff members. The results are clear in that we continue to deliver the projects that are in the STIP, as well as providing local support and um, working with the general public. The right-of-way staff in the districts are the face of MoDOT that deal with customers as well as property owners. So they are fair, they're honest, they're very um, customer service friendly. Uh, we have a consistent 4.7 out of 5 scale on our customer service surveys, which is incredible considering what the, the right-of-way staff are doing. Yeah. Property management is no, another function that the right-of-way staff take care of. Um, we have excess parcels that the commission gets involved with approval on executing deeds to convey property. Uh, the the, the uh, highway system encompasses about 350,000 acres. That includes roadway, right-of-way, easements, wetlands, utility corridors, uh, district offices, I mentioned excess properties and maintenance facilities. Considering Missouri has 44.2 million acres statewide and Missouri is the 21st um, state in land mass, that gives you an idea of what encompasses MoDOT's right away or MoDOT's property. Over the last decade, the right away teams have put money back into the road fund by excess sales and leasing 
in the last decade, uh, the right-of-way team has generated $62.6 .6 million in excess right-of-way sales, as well as $5.9 million in lease um, income. Billboards and junkyards are also part of design division. This is an area that is highly monitored because of the uh, Highway Beautification Act of 1965. This is a federal program. If MoDOT does not comply with the rules of the billboards, uh, we can be in jeopardy of losing federal funds. Our outdoor advertising team consists of eight <clears throat> individuals and they are in the districts so that they can cover the areas they're assigned to. They are central office employees, however, so they report to design division. They monitor 11,136 signs and they are, those signs are owned by 1,637 sign owners. There are 386 digital signs that are also monitored and 349 junkyards. The biggest complaint that we receive on the billboards are the content. However, content is not a monitored item. Uh, they are, it's one of those things that if it's offensive, we can contact the sign owner and they usually are very good about removing the, the offensive contact, content, excuse me. In conclusion, uh, we've covered a few of the services and functions that design division um, takes care of. Uh, to, we work with internal and external customers on a regular basis. We uh, assist the districts in delivering projects. And what de design division is known for is delivering projects. Uh, however, providing the support and guidance and offering tools to fill the gaps, actually that saves time and money, um, is our everyday service. The central office design team continues to develop relationships with locals, federal highway, the local governments, um, some of the other governmental agencies, and the public. And we strive to provide exceptional customer service with the focus on keeping the traveling public safe and MoDOT staff safe. Innovative standards are updated on a continual basis. That's an ongoing um, thing that we are always in, um, involved in because it's an ever-changing environment as well as an ever-changing transportation system. The better we get, the better we get at getting better. Thank you. I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments for Travis, Ashley, or Brenda? Commissioner so, Boatwright? So, the, uh, so uh, a lot of us that, that are do construction work in the state of Missouri have gotten really spoiled with the GPS real-time network that uh, Missouri has. And um, I, I just want to say the, the way it's managed and um, the amount of downtime that we see with it is just incredible. Your, your staff does a really good job on keeping it up, but we are spoiled yeah. using it, I'm telling you. Well, thank you. And I mentioned there's 11 people that are in the CAD department that oversee that, but really there's one person who travels all across the state to maintain. Well, they do a very good uh, job. So, well, I will relay that. Thank yeah, you. and the, um, the other thing, I, I see that uh, there's a lot of GIS usage going on, which I mean, from the standpoint of being able to better manage or um, know where you're um, assets are throughout the state. I mean, it's an incredible pl platform to use. So it's it's very good to see um, see that we're utilizing it the best way we can. So really appreciate um, everything that you guys do. I mean, the month in month out when we see these bids go out the door, I know it takes a lot of people behind the scenes to to do that, but we we do appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Well, Commissioner, yeah. uh, just real quick on uh, ever since we toured the uh, Buck O'Neill project and the historic preservation part, what do we do with all those artifacts? And is there a way for the public to view those? There's right now, there's really not a way for the public to view all of them. We actually uh, work in association with, with the University of Missouri Columbia, and we actually have a, uh, a facility that we built, but now it's theirs, and that's where a lot of them are stored. And so depending on what it is, you know, if it's a, if it's human remains, there's actually a process to get those back to where they go. If it's a specific tribe or something like that. So we're, we're working on that, but a lot of the artifacts remain in uh, the, the university's care. And then they sometimes make decisions of 
maybe display those in places or not. But, you know, it depends on what you find. You know, some stuff, you know, these folks, they can tell for a little, what a little chip is. I think it looks like a little chip of something, but archaeologists <laughs> know what it is, you know. So they, they, they properly uh, maintain that and work with the, with the, the so right authorities. Is so. that at, at Columbia then? Or? Yes, it is in Columbia. It's uh, they uh, they actually uh, are working now. We have a MOU with them to have some of their grad students kind of go through and uh, finish up the process on some of that information and get it, you know, renew our efforts to send stuff back out. You know, they kind of got slowed down with COVID university with students being gone, but they usually have students work on that type of information to get it sent back out. So. I just know it was very interesting stuff we saw at Buck oh, yeah. and it, um, it would be nice if the public could share in that because mm -hmm. That's a lot of history. And then exactly what what on junkyards, you didn't mention much on junkyards. Is that just like keeping them from proximity of the highway system or? Well, not everybody's land ornament or yard ornaments are considered junk. Um, there, There's actually rules with junkyards there. Even though someone has 12 cars parked in their front yard, that doesn't constitute as a junkyard. So the junkyards must be screened if they're within so many feet of a, a monitored route. And the, the routes that the ODA staff monitor are the um, in the highway system. So there's a little more to it than what we actually maintain as MoDOT. So yes, their junkyards are um, a, a constant problem. Problem, yes. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to put that positive, but um, it, it also falls under the local government to uh, help assist. But normally, if if someone just has a lot of stuff in their yard, if we ask them to clean it up, they're they're willing to do that. It just takes sometimes five to 10 years for them to get it all cleaned up. But yes, so junkyards do have to be screened and have to have certain restrictions. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, there's the old adage student, old dog and new trick. I didn't know we had GIS. <laughs> Where do I find it? Well, actually, uh, most of the stuff we're on the design division and our surveyors and our CAD department, we're, we're kind of on that gathering side, but a lot of it's uh, housed and planning with our transportation management system. So that goes with all of our asset monitoring and, and items that are on the uh, it's TMS on the website maps. though. Uh, yes. It's, yeah. Data Mart. So it's available externally for a lot of folks. We'll send you a link. Yeah. yeah. We'll send it to you. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other question I have for Brenda, is there a schedule of excess real estate right away that is made available or do people have to identify it themselves? Uh, no, we have a list. We have an inventory list. Um, I mentioned the right away applications. We keep track of all the um, active right away. We keep track of the excess parcels. We have a few um, parcels listed on an external MoDOT site. It's called Realty to Roads. It's um, an advertisement. We also sell on GovDeals property that is available, but excess property isn't um, easy to dispose of because many times it's only available to the adjoining landowner because it may not have access. So there's a lot of restrictions for uh, some of the excess sales. Is there a link for that? I, <laughs> yes. I, and my last question, uh, signage on right-of-ways, if someone has a four by eight sign just off of the right-of-way in a farmer's field, what do you do with that? Well, all signs have to be off the right-of-way. So if you're seeing oh, a good. sign, yes, they cannot be on, um, only highway signs can be within the right-of-way. So does every four by eight sign on Highway 94 have to have a permit? Correct, unless it's a church. Oh, it does need a permit then? Yes. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Unless the church is advertised for someone else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they tried that. Yeah. Sausage <laughs> dinner, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. That was wonderful. Next item is a non action item. We have an update of MoDOT's financial services division from Todd Grossner. Good morning, Chairman Brinkman, Commissioners, Director McKenna. Oh, you're just like right there, aren't you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> keep an eye on him, Todd. <laughs> I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about financial services, something that is near and dear to my heart. 
The role of financial services is to provide administrative support to this engineering organization. Now, I understand it's about the engineers, but it's got money involved in it too. <laughs> we strive to provide outstanding customer service as we process the money coming into and out of the department. We strive to provide financial stability with balanced spending plans through revenue forecasting, budgeting, and reporting. And we have some very talented people in financial services, but I don't think you want us building roads and bridges like Travis's shop. We both do math, but we do it in a different way, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Our world is all about this, the bucket graphics, the money flowing into the department and the money flowing out of the department. Financial services here at the central office it's made up of 53 employees, and we're mostly located on the second floor of this building. Like all divisions that you hear about, our biggest challenge is with staff turnover and retention. Since January, you know, I'm a numbers guy, so I got to do the numbers. January 2019, we've had 46 job fills for 29 positions. Twelve of those 29 positions have been filled more than once. I've got some positions I've filled three and four times. And probably the number that's most shocking to me is 55% of the people sitting upstairs on the second floor in my shop weren't even in their current position on January 2019, just a little over three years ago. And after I did the math, it made sense, but I just, it, it kind of shocked me when I, when I saw that. And this doesn't even include two more resignations that I know of that are going to happen on April 15th. Financial services is structured into teams based on their expertise and their knowledge, their critical function, but we're all linked together. Now, I hope it's okay. As I go through these overviews, I'll introduce you to some people, some of the people that make my job a lot easier. It's all about the people to me, our number one, number one resource. Our program administration project accounting and receivables team is led by Sunshine Wildy. Sunny started her MoDoc career in 1998 as a summer intern in the Northeast <laughs> District while she was going to college. And she quickly worked her way up the ranks through management. She's one of our key leaders that has grown up in our organization. Her team houses for all these acronyms you see listed here. Federal Highway Administration, Transit, Rail, Aviation, Highway Safety, Motor Carriers, they help ensure that we're complying with all the federal guidelines and requirements so we don't jeopardize our ability to receive reimbursements from these agencies. Her team also administers our partnering or sometimes we call our innovative finance programs. The cost share economic development program sets aside funds in the STIP to leverage city and county funds to build state transportation improvement projects. Since 2004, $541 million of cost share funds have leveraged $705 million of local cash and local federal funds to be spent on our system. The Missouri Transportation Finance Corporation or State Infrastructure Bank, we called MTFC slash SIB. This is a federal program that makes loans to private and public entities to fund transportation improvements. Over the last 26 years, the MTSC has processed 78 loans, totaling $374 million to deliver $1.2 billion in transportation improvements. Currently, we have 25 active loans with repayments totaling $105 million to be repaid over the next 13 years. The State Transportation Assistance Revolving, or STAR Fund, we call it, is a similar loan program, but it's for the non-highway uh, modes of our organization, such as aviation, ports, rail, and mass transit. This $4 million STAR Fund was authorized by the General, General Assembly in 1997 with general revenue. Her team's also involved in the formation of transportation development districts and transportation corporations. Her team manages the money coming into the department as reimbursements for projects from, from the federal government 
payments from other states for border bridge projects and from local agencies for partnering projects. Our accounts payable and payroll team is led by Deborah Downing. Debbie started her MoDOT career in 2018. She's a very talented leader that came to us from another state agency. Her team is responsible for the money flowing out of the department. She, she's in charge of the contractor payments, consultant invoices, right-of-way acquisitions, utility relocations for the construction program, and she's responsible for the uh, materials and supplies that are purchased by all the divisions here at the central office. In addition to this, she's in charge of our payroll system. And as we all know, if everybody's getting paid on time, everybody's pretty happy. But that can flip the other way, and she does a great job to jump in there and resolve any issues that we might have. Her team also manages our chart of accounts and revises our policies and procedures as needed. Our financial planning and reporting team is led by Janelle Lucanati. You got to meet her last night at the dinner with the leadership coins. Janelle started her MoDOT career in 2017, and she's another bright star that we stole from another state agency. What I think is pretty cool about Janelle is she's a second generation MoDOT employee. I know we have others like, I hate to mention Jay Wanderlake, but he's a second generation. I worked with his dad, so that's why I, 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 I mentioned it because of his dad, not because of him, if you know what I mean. Her mom, Flo Schulte, retired in 2003 after a 30 year career in financial services. Now, the first team I mentioned is the money that is flowing into the department, Sonny's team, and the second team, Debbie's, was the money flowing out. Well, Janelle's team gets the responsibility of keeping all that in sync. She's the one that has to come up with the financial plan so we stay balanced. And I think the financial forecast is probably the most important thing that financial services provides for this department. It's the financial backbone that establishes our spending plan based on revenue and expenditure estimates. The financial forecast is presented to you in January and it's used to develop the appropriations request which is presented to you in September. Janelle's team follows that appropriations request all the way through the legislative process with the Senate hearings and the House hearings and all the way to the governor's approval. The appropriations request is then allocated to our divisions and districts as their spending plans after your approval in June. Her team provides the department's monthly and quarterly financial statements that you all have in your packet every month. Her team ensures internal controls are in place, which leads to clean audits. Her team works with the independent auditors to prepare the department's annual comprehensive financial report, which includes an audit report. This is the team that has delivered to you 22 consecutive clean audits. Her team manages the bonding program, which she provides a report to you in July of every year. And her team administers our banking agreements for our accounts held outside of the state treasury for self-insurance, medical life insurance, local fund, and MTFC. And after I put this presentation together, I'm thinking, boy, Janelle takes care of a lot of stuff for me, doesn't she? Okay, some of, the, some of our other teams include claims administration, that's responsible for the self-insurance operations of this department, which deal with fleet liability, general liability, and property, property damage recovery uh, for motorists that damage our property. Our archives staff manages our physical paper records, and our data mart, I don't know how it's to describe them, they're just these wicked smart systems guys that provide system administration for the accounting system. They provide report writing, customized reports for users department-wide. The central office also works very closely with our district staff. We have 43 financial services staff located in the district offices throughout the state. And they are led by our support services managers who report to our district engineers. They provide administrative support to their district management teams for accounts payable, payroll, budgeting, and other accounting functions. 
I've talked about staff turnover and retention at the central office, and I know the districts are, their challenge is even greater out there. Um, Kathy Tripp in our, in our Northwest district, she assumed this leadership position in October of 2021. Stephen Pike, he's one of, one of our veterans in the Northeast district. I truly appreciate his leadership and knowledge. Judy Magruder in Kansas City, she will be stepping away from this position in the next month or two. Robin McKee in the Central District, she accepted this position in July 2019. And Malena Carter in St. Louis, she accepted this position in January 2022, just earlier this year. Now, Deborah Sarton and Jody Mills in the southern part of the state, those again are some of my veterans and I truly appreciate their leadership and, and knowledge. Now, there's one person I haven't mentioned through this whole presentation, um, and I asked him to, to attend this, this meeting in person, and he thought, oh, great, but it's too bad. He had to do it anyway, and that's Doug Hood, your Assistant Financial Services Director. Would you please stand, Doug? Doug started his MoDoc career in 1995 and quickly grew into one of your top leaders in this department. He and I have worked very closely together for the last 22 years in various positions. And I am very thankful and honored to work side by side with him as we lead your financial services division. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate all you do. And Chairman, that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, Todd, giving that presentation, he didn't really point to himself, uh, but he's a leader of this organization, um, has a great way of providing advice without sounding like you're just doing something silly. And uh, um, and and frankly, you know, I bring him stuff that that he should turn around and say, that's just not we shouldn't do that. And, it, you know, but he's got a he's he's a tremendous leader. He develops employees um, and uh, and he is very well uh, appreciated and liked by the people that work with him uh, and, and for him in the organization. And that's a that's a great statement of his leadership. But uh, in concert with Brenda. Um, I, I really do believe we have probably the finest financial team in a state DOT anywhere in the nation. So thank you, Todd. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, that. Todd. Okay, our next item on the agenda is a non-action item, an update on Employee Advisory Council. And we have Aisha Wright Crowder, Employee Advisory Council Chair, will give us an update. Aisha? Oh, you got your wingman with you. <laughs> Good morning, Commission. Um, Commissioner, uh, Chairman Brinkman, and Director McKenna. Um, I wanted to just come up and introduce Aisha. This is going to be our first presentation to the Commission. So thank you for the opportunity to sure. um, talk about the Employee Advisory Council um, this morning and to give it and a great update i had a chance to visit with them on yesterday and they're doing a great job they got a lot of things going on and some good um uh you know insight that they have for the employees statewide but um aisha wright crowder she's the um, eac chair um, she's a transportation data analyst in the Whoa. design division <laughs> um as a matter of fact travis just um highlighted you know that division and she actually works in bidding um, and contract services. What she does during the letting is she educates um, contractors on the required steps when submitting their bids and serves as their guide if needed. Um, after the letting, she actually downloads all the confidential bids and imports them into the system to be reviewed by staff and the division for award that ultimately comes to you all to vote on. Um, she's been with MoDOT for four and a half years, and she's been the EAC chair for two and a half years. So, Aisha, take it away. Welcome, Aisha. 
Don't be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't before. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman, Commissioner, Director. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to represent the Statewide Employee Advisory Council. It is truly an honor. While I'm here today, I wanted to just talk about a few things that the statewide has been up to um, and just to highlight the excellent team that we have working for us. So we're gonna start with going over what our purpose is. So the department recognizes one of the most integral components of our workforce is to respect, appreciate the values, ideas, cultures, and the background of others. So in 2005, the EAC was established to foster and enhance a positive and a supportive work environment here. So that is in the form of assisting management with cultural diversity, communication issues, and just simply policy review. So in order for the statewide, a member to be on the statewide team, they have to meet few qualifications because essentially the statewide committee is the sounding board for management and also the voice of the employees. So they have to be a full-time employee and they have to be in good standing. You're wondering what good standing means. No probation and no disciplinary action, whether it's verbal or written, because we are the leaders here of the employees and so we have to be a good representation of such. Each member is serving a three-year term and during that time, they have to uphold those standards. The EAC makeup. So our team is made up of three representations from each district and also four director's choice. So that equals a tw a 28 members. Of the 28 members, 54% is maintenance and 46% is from other departments. For example, design, transportation planning, and constructions and materials, just to name a few. And right now we have a 98% where the members attend our monthly meetings. We have a meeting every month because of course there's always a pressing topic, correct? So our members are devoting their time to being on this volunteer committee and making sure that they're there each month. So good job to the team. So I'd like to take a moment here just to introduce our leadership team. You have myself, who is the chair of the EAC, as well as the chair of the subcommittees, Marketed and Culture. We have my vice chair, Kenny Rhodes, who is also the chair of the subcommittee, Nominating. We have Lester Wood, who stepped in because, as you know, Rudy retired last month, and Lester has graciously accepted to be a part of the team and to support us. We have the chair of our subcommittee, Communications and Safety, which is Michelle Dunback, and Ron Mize, we have our secretary, Allison Talley, our assistant secretary, Stacy Honer, and the chair of our subcommittee, Health and Wellness, Joshua Carey. At each of our meetings monthly, we have a safety moment, a culture moment, and a health and wellness moment, because we believe that those need to start from within our group and transpire within our sections and hopefully go towards, out towards the organization. Mm -hmm. So I've talked about the leadership, but of course, the entire statewide is a great team. So here is the pictorial dep de depiction of our team. So as you see, three members there per district, wonderful team members. They are not just showing up for work, they're showing up and they're also volunteering to be a part of the statewide team. And while they're a part of the statewide team, they're also growing and they're developing within the organization. So during their time frame here that they've been on the EAC, we've had crew leader promotions for Chad, Blake, Wyatt, and Kevin Wildhaber. We've had supervisor promotions for Kenneth and Roy. We've had development of leadership through the Maintenance Leadership Academy for Roger, James Miles, and Wyatt. We've had educational development, both Ali and Josh, have completed their PDI, their respective levels of the PDI, which is the Professional Development Institute. And we have Andrew who has completed the Emerging Leaders Program. We have our very own, because you guys mentioned the Buck O'Neill um, program earlier, the design bill. 
with our very own Ryan Kanab, who was promoted to be the project engineer on that Buck O'Neill design build project there. And lastly, myself, I just graduated from the State of Missouri Leadership Academy last month. Well, actually, we're in April now, so it's in February. <laughs> So I just wanted to take that opportunity to just congratulate each and every member here, a part of the team. They are doing an extraordinary job, and I am just extremely proud of them. Without their support and their constant feedback there, the EAC would not be successful at all. So here's just a few highlights of some of the events that we've been a part of. Um, we participate in a number of capacities. There's the 4th of July parade, the State Fair, Buckle Up, Phone Down, of course, and then the Missouri Coalition of Safety, just to name a few. The team itself has had its own accomplishments. So we have our round table. Actually, we're getting ready to have that tomorrow. Each year we have a round table where the statewide EAC and the district EAEC sit down and we discuss best practices. These best practices help us in serving the department better. We want to figure out what's the best way to go about ensuring that the employees are heard and to ensuring that we are serving the department well. So we sit down and we talk about this and we also take this moment to do staff education. Last year it was on communication issues. This year it's gonna be on leadership because we want to continue to develop our leaders. So we also um, reestablish our spotlight issues. Our spotlight issues is like our newsletter. It's our way how we communicate to the MoDOT body about what we're currently discussing, what the hot topics are, just our way of being transparent. And we send out our spotlight issues quarterly. We have assisted with different policies, the PPE, the boot project, and the safety footwear policy. And we have also assisted with conducting surveys and providing feedback for the long-term service awards. Because if you're gonna put in the work, we wanna make sure that the the award that you get is something that you actually value and that you need. So we assisted with providing that feedback there to the team to update those awards. Last but not least, we have assisted with the, or well, actually we've created the employee appreciation events. During the pandemic, the team and I wanted to come up with a way to highlight the statewide diversity, promote inclusion, increase work for, workforce morale. During the pandemic, everyone was struggling. We all were. It's just something that hit us and we wanted to figure out a way, how do we make the employees still feel like they're valued? How do we make them feel like they're still part of the team? And so that's how we coined the employee appreciation events and we do this annually. We wanted to get involved and we wanted to motivate at all levels. So we've had different events like the maintenance scavenger hunt, Trivia is crossword, word search, and we we even had an SMT battle. What's, so <laughs> what is what is that? It's a so we had a basically it's a trivia solely for senior management, and we had base we wanted to see who knew the most about Modat. So you could not Google, you could not <laughs> you could not phone a friend is what I said in the instructions, <laughs> but we sent it out to just the senior management team and said, here are the questions, answer as many as you could. And we had so much feedback, it was amazing. That's there cool. were so many senior <laughs> management that were submitted. I was first <laughs> and it was just a, a really good feeling. And Can we see their scores? <laughs> <laughs> I'll email it to you. <laughs> but it, it was amazing. And we wanted to have the events that was geared towards a specific group, like the maintenance. They can't sit at their computer and, and completed trivia. So we had the maintenance scavenger hunt. Oh. And those were pictures from the scavenger hunts there um, that we had just doing their safe, um, their safe task at work. And then of course we had a um, another winner up there, Eric, and he was showcasing his prizes. We had different organizations donate prizes to us. And so we were able to give those out to the employees. So just promoting friendly competition. <laughs> So while I'm here, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for supporting and valuing the EAC and the district EAEC. Thank you for attending the meetings, being open, honest, 
and researching and answering concerns because it's through your leadership here as the commissioner and the director that the senior management and executive team is able to support us. So we wanna thank you for that. Our top concerns and discussions that we've had has been in relation to safety, telework, pay, and of course COVID. <laughs> Hopefully that would stop being a discussion. <laughs> So just a few reminders, the EAC is a resource group. We're here to help senior management and we're here to help statewide employees. As I said, we are the voice of the employees and the sounding board for senior management. So consider us for any special teams, anything that you guys are interested in working on and just want to hear our feedback, that's what we're here for. We want you to continue to convey the importance to supervisors to allow employees to participate because through participation is why this council is successful. 2005, 2022, we've been chugging along for a while. Allow the local chairman to be a part of the district management team. And we have reminded our employees that our anonymous inquiry process is just to be used to help solve issues. Even though it's anonymous, we want to keep it upstanding is the best way to put it. <laughs> so again, Chairman, Commissioner, and Director, thank you guys for the opportunity to be here this morning. It was truly an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, do you guys have any questions for me or my team? Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions, just a comment. I see you did a wonderful job. And, and thank you for educating us on the EAC. Absolutely. Uh, I've never heard this in the, my short tenure on the commission. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the most important part of MoDOT is the people. And, you know, great morale. And I know sometimes with all the things that have gone on, the pandemic and everything, it's hard to keep your morale up. But... <laughs> it's so important. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Aisha, um, one thing that stuck out when you were talking was you wanted to ensure employees are heard, right? Absolutely. And so I'm going to give you a chance here. So, uh, what, what would you say is the one message that the employees would want to present to the commission? I mean, work environment, the morale, what weighs on the employee's mind that we need to know about? And it cannot be pay because we're already working on that. <laughs> are you sure? We are that is on our minds. <laughs> so speaking as myself and from what I've heard is just continue to value us. We, as you've heard with the different um, divisions here at Moda, they are doing hard work and it's not just because they're being forced to it it's because they want to do it sure. and so just continue to value that and just show appreciation sometimes uh, of course the pay is great but showing the effort taking the time to show that you value what they're doing you value their input you value their hard work it makes a whole lot of difference it does. Pat on the back. There. <laughs> Good job. If that's even what you do, it, it makes a difference, trust me. So like Commissioner Smith, I wasn't exactly aware of this. I think it's great that we have this presentation. How do you interface with upper management? How does, there's four director appointees I saw on there. And how, how does that get up to this building? <laughs> Aisha lets me join their meetings every month. <laughs> um, That's great. You know, they they have a busy agenda and um, frankly need time just within their team uh, to go through the issues and to discuss those. But there is, I would say, wide open communication and it's fostered. When Aisha said, you know, that part about the anonymous feedback piece, uh, I will tell you that um, when, and, and that's, that's a really um, wide open thing. We get, we get questions um, on any matter of topics and uh, the, you know, every once in a while you'll see some where we might have, you know, issues of pay, things like that, that feel like aren't being addressed because, you know, we're a public agency and, and there are many, many factors here. Um, and sometimes some of those 
um, inquiries can come across very directly um, and uh, and raw. And um, the EAC actually goes back and responds directly and, and will reject, um, you know, disrespectful inquiries and ask. It, it's a training opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. To um, how, how do you come back and, and come with your issue in a in a professional manner? They've done a terrific job of that because that is almost completely devoid of what comes through in an anonymous Dropbox, you know, that you would think would be otherwise sometimes. Um, and, you know, I just find, as she said, it, it's the way that they communicate with leaders is they're building them and becoming them. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Aisha's really done a terrific job in her tenure of, of really pushing that, pushing each other and herself to take and avail themselves of all the training that um, is available at MoDOT to, to seek additional opportunities um, that are happening by the minute here at MoDOT with the, um, with the turnover that we've had. So I, I find it invaluable um, and very much uh, just a part of working together as a team. Uh, that many times you find friction between um, between uh, management and and the team, and uh, I don't find there's a distinction between management and the team here. Uh, it, uh, you know that may not always feel the same way, but that's the way I feel about it. Uh, and um, it, it really, and and honestly, you can't go anywhere in the state without bumping into one of the EAC members. Um, regardless, you know, I was I was just getting my tires changed over it over at Sam's Club a week ago and and got uh, James uh, James Hake in trouble because he was supposed to be shopping with his wife and we were just chewing the fat while, <laughs> while my tires were being changed. Made my time go by a lot faster. I, I apologize to James because I think uh, he was supposed to be shopping. But um, it's a great group of people and they care about the organization and, um, and it comes through with all of the issues that we have. Um, we've had members that will come and testify uh, in, in the legislature on, on key issues and legislation that's pending. It, and it's, it's impactful um, when, when that happens. But um, universally, uh, I, I find this to be just such an engaged group that cares about each other. And, and uh, you can't help but, but be um, impressed by that and, and want to be responsive to it. So a couple of things you said, the PDI and the emerging leaders, we have emerging leaders, our company actually all, all day tomorrow is an event. Uh, are those programs that were developed in MoDOT, are they purchased out uh, from a vendor that you use? And I don't want to go into it now, but I'd be interested in knowing more about that. And then can I get on your quarterly newsletter? Absolutely. We'll showcase you. <laughs> the PDI is something that um, MoDA does offer here, and I'm actually a part of the PDI program as well. And I'm one one elective away from completing my third level. But it's it's available to employees who yeah, I'd have. I'd like to see what that is. Yeah. Yes, and it's based on different divisions as well. So myself, I'm taking the PDI for design. Um, another teammate has taken the PDI for um, construction and materials, and one has taken it for transportation planning as well. So it's it helps. It helps with get, getting you that education within your division to help you um, advance in your current role. Yeah, great. Can you get me on that, Madam Secretary? <laughs> Any other comments? Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Boy, we are right on schedule again. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a non-action item. Nicole Hood, State Highway Safety and Traffic Engineer, and Captain John Hutz, Missouri State Highway Patrol, present the Work Zone Awareness Week. Nicole, I think you're speaking first. Yes, and real quick, I want to say, Aisha, you did a fabulous job. And, you know, I do appreciate Aisha's leadership, and she's also a very strong advocate for Buckle Up, Phone Down. She's marched in the parades with us and brought her children along. So thank you, Aisha. Appreciate all that. 
So good morning, Chairman Brinkman, Commissioners Director McKenna. Thank you so much for the opportunity for Captain Hotz and I to be able to join you today to be able to talk about work zone awareness. So every spring we do bring attention to motorists and worker safety in and around our work zones during National Work Zone Awareness Week. So next week, April 11th through the 15th is National Work Zone Awareness Week. And our theme this year is work with us. And before I forget, I want to just remind everyone that next Wednesday is Go Orange Wednesday. So it's an opportunity to wear your orange to be able to show your support for work zone awareness. Okay, so the reality of work, work zone safety, unfortunately, is very grim. Last year, we had 17 people who were killed in work zone crashes, including three of our MoDOT employees. And according to our preliminary data, we had 55 serious injuries in our work zones as well. And for the second year in a row, we had all-time record high number of TMA hits, which, you know, those are hits when folks actually run into our protective vehicles. So we ended the year last year with 61 of our TMAs that were hit. So not only do highway workers need to protect themselves, but they're relying on the drivers around them to make smart choices when they're driving. You know, the, their lives are in, in the hands of other folks unfortunately. So this here is a short video and it's a prime example of what our workers are up against. This is a situation where a gentleman named Randall Siddons was killed in a distracted driving crash and this occurred in Columbia, Missouri um, in 2019. And I'll tell you it is, um, it's a difficult video to watch but I want to share this with you here real quick. A careless action affects everyone, the families involved, the victim involved, the one that caused the reckless act, their life is going to be changed for forever as well. It also affects the whole community. The whole community grieves the loss of someone that's killed in a crash. Everything you do matters. Everything you do has consequences. you got to drive your vehicle safely. So just very sad, very tragic incident. And I've grown very close with Randall's wife, Adrienne Siddons, and she's a huge advocate for us with the Hands Free Coalition. She's um, advocating very much for hands free um, legislation in Missouri. So I appreciate her being willing to share her story with all of us to help raise awareness. So with the rise in the reckless and aggressive driving, especially what we've seen over the last couple of years with the pandemic, it just seems like folks who are out there speeding, you know, the recklessness, it just really seemed to rise over the last couple of years. So we're really urging workers to just expect the unexpected when they're out there. And we're really trying to emphasize to drivers to stay focused when they're behind the wheel, you know, slow down. Um, Last year, distracted driving, it contributed to 336 work zone crashes. Speeding, that is another one of those contributors that we can see time and time again. It was involved in 11% of our work zone crashes. And not only do we want to protect the workers, but we also want to make sure that you know, the folks that are driving through our work zones are protected. And one of the simplest things that those folks can do is buckle up. But you can see last year, 70% of the vehicle occupant fatalities in work zones that were killed were unbuckled. And we all know that this is such a simple choice. And I appreciate all your all's advocacy for buckle up, phone down. But we know two seconds, get in your vehicle, buckle up, make that a routine when you get in there. So ultimately, what we're really asking everyone to do as this construction season ramps up is we want folks to work with us. So we can do our best. We can design. We can plan our work zones accordingly. We can train employees. We can coordinate with our contractors. We can collaborate with our wonderful partners, such as Captain Hots. We can have more safety in our work zones, you know, have that presence of enforcement out there. But we really need folks to work with us. And like I said, simple things, slow down, pay Pay attention, buckle up. And it's not just for our safety, it's for their safety as well. So here's a short PSA. This was developed by our communications division. These are folks from MoDOT. Um, and this is a PSA that we're, we'll be sharing during Work Zone Awareness Week. No matter where, no matter when, no matter what, Whoa. 
Work with us. Work with us. Work with us. So thank you to the communications division and all the employees that helped create this. Um, we have several strategies that we've been implementing here at MoDOT, and I've shared some of these with you. I thought today I could just touch base and give you an update on some of these. So um, one of the more recent things is real-time digital alerts. And the way this works is right now we have this uh, unit on 500 of our emergency response and our work zone vehicles. And what how it works is when the lights are activated on our vehicles, then those folks who are traveling towards our work zone who are using the Waze app, in addition to other navigation apps, then they'll receive alert that there is a work zone ahead and move over. So if you're out there and you're traveling and one of our trucks flips their lights on, you have your Waze app on. Good news though, we actually just found out last week that Apple Maps is also going to be um, sending these alerts to drivers. And we also found out that Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Chrysler vehicles will have this technology. Sorry, Mr. Smith. <laughs> 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 they'll have this <laughs> they'll have this technology in dashboard so we will be able to communicate to folks by turning our lights on and letting them know slow down move over there's something ahead that you need to be cautious and aware of so um, this will enable us to be able to alert our motorists. Like I said, the technology has expanded. Um, we're very excited about this. We did have some growing pains last year with implementing this technology. We're in good standing right now. So I'm hopeful that this will help us kind of minimize some of those hits that we're seeing. Another item, I know I've talked to you about this before too, but the autonomous TMAs, I'm excited to say that now that we're into the endemic, so we're past the pandemic, we're able to pick this up again and we're able to move this forward. So the autonomous TMA, what that is, is a leader follower, follower system. And kudos to Chris Redline, the um, Kansas City DE, for, for helping you know implement this and get this to move forward. But the way this works is that follower um, protective truck that has that TMA, our goal is that we wanna get that operator out of that back TMA, because more times than not, we see that folks are running into that back protective truck. So the autonomous TMA it's in the Kansas City District has already went through what we call the closed road testing. So right now in the Kansas City District, they've done refresher training, and they are going to be bringing the, this unit out onto open road with the striping operation. So as soon as those temperatures get to where we need them be need them to be to be able to get out get out there, sorry, and start striping, we're going to be able to get out there and test this autonomous TMA. Another um, good news on this one is the Southwest District also has some of their trucks that have been um, modified to be able to support the autonomous TMA. So Southwest District will have to step back and do some more the closed road testing, but once all that part is done, then they're going to be able to get out there in the open roads and test this. And we also have the university on board, and they're going to evaluate the effectiveness of this. You know, what value are we truly getting from this? We're hoping it's wonderful value, and this is something we're going to be able to move forward with. So it's an exciting, it's an exciting area and exciting technology. A few other strategies, the temporary rumble strips, this is an item that we're continuing to implement and use in our work zones. Um, we include this when we plan and when we design our projects. We've implemented automated flagger devices. This is another one of those tools, came from the innovative minds of our employees. Right now, we were able to get 14 of these units out across the state. And then um, based upon some recent feedback, Becky and Ed traveling around the state, visiting the maintenance buildings, there was some additional interest. So we purchased three additional units, um, Southwest District and Central District. Um, that's exciting. Another wonderful tool with these automated flagger devices is they have larger arrow boards on them, and we call them full matrix arrow boards. So they have a brighter target value, um, and this is something that more of our districts are starting to use as well. Icon technology, similar to some of the things I've talked about with the real-time digital alerts, but icon technology is actually something where you can have, say, an icon out at your work zone location, and it will have a mechanism to be able to communicate to oncoming vehicles. This is something that we're using in various projects throughout the state, too, which is it's another wonderful tool just to be able to give folks that advance notice they need to be paying attention. And then Operation Protect, this is something, you know, we 
I guess we tokened it several years ago, but um, through the help of Captain Hots, this is something we kind of resurrected again last year. And what this is, is um, PROTECT stands for Patrol Response Operation to Enforcement of Construction Zone Traffic. But ultimately what it is, is, you know, we've always had a wonderful partnership with the patrol. We include... Um, local enforcement presence in our work zones, but we kind of ramped that up again last year. And then this year, we've already identified our top work zones. So we're going to ramp that up again with additional enforcement. And so now I want to invite Captain Hotz um, to go ahead and share some of his insight and his perspective on work zone awareness. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Commissioners and Director. Uh, Patrick's making me a little nervous here because I got a feeling he's got a hook there. And if I go too long, <laughs> he's going to turn. Right, that <laughs> no, I'll try to keep you guys definitely on. It. Try to keep you rolling there. So uh, Nicole has talked a lot about uh, a variety of, of technology that has come along over the last several years. I can remember starting in 1989. I know I don't look that old, but in 1989 in Bates County, uh, I remember getting a radio call from the troop and they said uh, effective immediately. Uh, northbound 71, the passing lane is going to be closed for emergency concrete repairs. And so I'm driving up by Adrian and I think, well, that's weird because I'm the only guy working today. And I know it hasn't been a crash because nobody else works crashes but the patrol. And so, of course, I drive down there and that was just a play in time that they had decided to do that. And the first I found out about it was when it was already done. So uh, it's amazing how the communication has changed over what it was. And it wasn't that we didn't like each other because our zone office is right there in the shed. We just didn't talk about stuff like this. So when you look here, uh, you see planning, uh, coordinating, collaboration. Uh, now, before these projects take place, even the small projects, our local zone sergeants will get together with their uh, engineers in those areas and they'll talk about that and they'll see what can we do to make these areas uh, safer. Big construction projects, as you guys are well aware, sometimes take two years, three years to plan before we ever get started with that first, um, you know, the first shovel hits the, the ground there. And I would put our planning and collaborating up against probably any other uh, state in, in the country. I mean, we do a lot of stuff together to make sure that we are addressing the, the different concerns that we have. And it's not just on construction projects. Uh, when we have snowstorms, for example, I mean, we start uh, 48 hours out at uh, MoDOT and local agencies and SEMA and the patrol, uh, we all get together and we start planning, okay, how are we going to address this, whether it's snow or ice or flooding, whichever the case may be. Uh, we also, uh, you look at the crash down on Interstate 57. And if you watch that on camera, which I did from here, uh, the coordination there is amazing between uh, the patrol, MoDOT, these, uh, everybody, uh, emergency medical folks that are involved, the coordination is just amazing what we see, uh, what we see there. But even with all this technology, we know that we still have crashes, right? We still have crashes. So what is the lowest common denominator that we look at there uh, when you think about that? What is it? Is it the workers? Is it the zone? Or it's the drivers, right? And unfortunately, if you look up there, those are some of the top reasons that we see uh, for crashes in work zone enforcement areas. We know that we have speeding drivers, distracted drivers, uh, drivers that are falling too close, uh, drivers who are having medical issues. Unfortunately, those drivers are driving through those work zones each and every day. In fact, just last night, I know that you guys had uh, a truck that was hit down in Springfield, and it looks like that was an intoxicated driver. Fortunately, I don't believe the truck was occupied. Uh, and of course, it hit the attenuator. So uh, I don't think anybody from MoDOT was injured. But again, folks out there doing their job, and here comes an intoxicated driver and runs in uh, to the back of them. I'll give you a prime example, and Commissioner Smith will appreciate this. Uh, July 2020, I'm sitting on Dix Road in my brand new Ford F 150 responder pickup, and I'm, I'm stopped at the light. I'm um, looking, you know, towards Missouri Boulevard. You got 50 coming here and it's just me at the light. I stop and I hear an engine and I'm like, where is this engine coming from? And I'm looking around all over the place. I don't see one coming. I look in my rearview mirror, don't see one coming. I look that direction, don't see one coming. Uh, next thing I know, something hits my truck and pushes it, even with the brake on, five feet into the intersection. 
And the very first thing that I said, well, well I'm not going to tell you the first thing I said, but <laughs> the <laughs> second thing that I said, because I still didn't see a vehicle. I'm like, did I just get hit by an airplane? You know, what happened here? So I get out and here is a 40 year old middle aged person from Oklahoma at 730 in the morning that has driven her Mustang up to the air filter underneath my truck. Now, why was that? I don't know. She wasn't intoxicated. Uh, she didn't appear to be distracted. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure. I made sure she was OK because obviously I wasn't happy that my new truck had been tore up. So I figured the conversation, you know, we just minimize that uh, from there. But through the investigation, they didn't find any uh, any impairment or anything. So probably just not paying attention. The fact is we have these folks driving through our work zones each and every day. What if, right? Even with all of the most planning, collaborating, all those things, continually ask the question, what if? What if a drunk driver comes through this work zone? What if a distracted driver or a driver with a better um, somebody who has a multiple of issues, what if they drive through that work zone? We can never stop asking that question. When you look here and you see this picture, what do we see? What do we see in this picture? Everybody sees something different, right? Some people see construction projects. Some people see work. Some people see backups. Some people see we're making a lot of money here, right? But in reality, what should we see? We see our coworkers, our mothers, our fathers, our sons, daughters, brothers and sisters who are in these work zones. And I don't have to tell you guys how much it hurts when you lose somebody that's part of your family. So no matter what happens, we owe it to these people to continue asking that question, what if? We've done everything that we think we can, but we have to always ask that, that question. What if? Any questions? I promise I keep you on time. So. All right. Thank you guys very much. Mr. Chair. What year were you in Bates County? 1989 through 1994. Greg, the, not the real Greg Smith, the other Greg Smith was a class. <laughs> <laughs> He's retired now. Yes, sir. Another great presentation. I, I just continue to be amazed. 336 work zone crashes, 61 TMAs hit. I, I wonder about the, the TMAs. I see that last vehicle. Uh, it's pretty hefty stuff that people are running into. And I wonder about making that last vehicle or trailer out of plastic or something even less violent as aluminum. And uh, I just had a picture of somebody hitting that plastic thing and it just flying apart and there's a basket of tennis balls on it and they fly apart, <laughs> you know, something that it's not quite as dangerous to the, to the driver. And, and I know we're there to protect the, the MoDOT worker too, but Actually, uh, Commissioner, the the way those um, truck mounted attenuators are designed, that is, um, they're designed to absorb the the energy from yeah. the vehicle that's hitting them. Those protect the drivers that hit them. They are designed for that. Yeah. They they do uh, absorb that. They obviously uh, are there to protect our. Uh, employees as well, but we, you know, protective vehicles are not just truck mounted attenuators. They're also our work trucks. They're um, any, any vehicle that can be um, placed between uh, the workers and, and the driving public. So, um, you know, it's, it's striking though, that these get hit because you just can't be looking if you hit one of these they're yeah. you know it's like a it's an arms race we continue to put more flashing lights and and everything um as the public continues to become more and more distracted but i am I'm, I'm struck with you know look at the you know the arms race look at the technology we're trying to deploy um what uh, nicole pointed out uh we continue to advance in that and the partnership with the highway patrol is extraordinary um in the field co co 
um, joined in locations all over the state and um, responding um, at a moment's notice for for both, you know, us for them and them for us. It's it's really extraordinary. Um, um, that awareness is what we need. Yeah. Thank you. I just had a thought, Nicole. Has anyone ever seen uh, a trailing Jersey barrier? Because you, I see, I've seen Jersey barriers where they'll take them and they'll move them over from one lane to another automatically. But if you had a Jersey barrier back there that would divert, maybe we should innovate that. <laughs> Eric, did, Eric did it. <laughs> yeah, th there is a version that uh, kind of like a semi length that is uh, movable that moves with you. Uh, we've tested it in a couple of places. They're difficult because of their length to maneuver mm -hmm. and turn around and get set up. Uh, and they're especially difficult in multiple lane situations where you have to uh, oh, yeah. you know, try to shift them. So there are a few out there on the market uh, that we have looked at and they've changed over time. So we, we do a lot in this area with Nicole, uh, also through crash testing. Uh, but there is a version of that we've tested out. Didn't work at the best, but uh, we are watching those. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do we have items on the consent agenda that have been removed? No. Okay. Uh, next item is public comment period. Members of the public did not schedule a presentation before the commission may speak to the commission on transportation related issues and have signed the registration. Does do we have any? Okay. Typically at the end of each meeting, we like to provide each commissioner an opportunity to share any concerns or comments they may have. Today I'll start with Commissioner Eckert. Um, being on here for four years or five years, I guess it is, uh, even though we didn't have a lot of action items, I'd have to say this meeting has been one of the most educational meetings that I've attended. And all the presentations were great, very informative, and very educational. And that started yesterday with the audit committee. And thanks to the. There you go. It started yesterday with the audit committee. Um, uh, the chairman had asked for some documents and stuff that we were able to review and get a better understanding of how um, audits and investigations work. And thanks to Kelly and Eric for doing a great job of um, helping us better understand how that whole process works. Um, it was very educational. Um, the program last night was very rewarding and a, a great program and a great dinner. It was nice to uh, get together again uh, post COVID. Uh, congratulations to Kirby and and Matt and everyone for their uh, courageous uh, actions. Um, it's like everybody says, it's always amazing that every month we come here and we see how dedicated our employees are and to serving uh, their fellow. Uh, colleagues and the general public. Um, once again, the, all the presentations today were just fantastic. Um, following up with um, uh, what Aisha has had to say about, um, you know, giving the employees uh, recognition of the work that they do. I, I want to thank Marty for this past week and informing me of uh, the uh, safety programs that were going on in the uh, district one over at the tri c center um two different days two different uh groups of uh modon employees maintenance employees were going through safety training and uh, uh i didn't show up in my suit and tie i showed up in my <laughs> work clothes with some cow manure on my boots but i don't think that that uh, that um, bothered them because i just went and i told them that um we appreciated what they do and that uh, thanked them for their job. And it was not only, I think, rewarding for them, but it was very rewarding for me to see the response uh, that they gave me for just coming and taking the time to thank them for what they do. And um, I, I would tell everybody that anytime they have the opportunity to do that, to thank our employees on a one-to-one -one basis or in a group setting like that to do it because 
uh, I could tell by looking out across the crowd that they really appreciated me taking the time to go thank them for what they do and for sticking with us and that we had their back and that uh, we weren't going to uh, back down from what we think is right. And uh, just thank for doing the good work and uh, hang in there. So, um, and with that, um, I just wanted to say about um, safety awareness. Those of us in agriculture are gonna get real busy here um, out on the roads with our big farm equipment. And so uh, not only buckle up and phone down, phone down but just uh, be patient with us as we uh, travel down the roads and, and maybe make you have a, take a few extra minutes to get to where you're going because you can't get a pass piece of farm equipment. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And thanks for, you sent an uh, email to us about that. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Boatwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, usually I've got a list of things that I want to say. The only thing that I wrote down today was um, after hearing and, and getting to see the presentations, we're just absolutely blessed in this state to have the people that we have working for not only MoDOT, but the Highway Patrol and across the state um, looking out for the citizens of Missouri. So thank each and every one of you. Uh, we're also blessed for the opportunity that we have to invest back into our infrastructure. And, you know, this is not only uh, Missouri DOT, but across the country, that investment is coming back. And uh, whether it be waterway, freight, I mean, you take your pick. Uh, we, we've got an opportunity here and we must seize on it. And, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the way we live, the opportunities that we have had, everybody in this room, it's because the people before us invested in us. And uh, we have to do the same for our future generations. So we have a big task ahead of us. And I, I'm, I, I can tell each and every one of you that this team that we have, I, I couldn't pick a, a better group to lead us into the future and execute this big load that we have. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Bowie, Commissioner Waters. I only have three things. <laughs> First of all, uh, it's really great to see all the district engineers here today. Uh, I think uh, a large percentage of our crowd today are district engineers. So welcome back. It's good to see your faces. Looking forward to visit with you. Uh, second, Becky, the, the presentation on the trash pickup. I really appreciated that. The other night I was... Uh, at a friend's house we had a little group there trying to watch a basketball game and there was one lady there from kansas who just kept pounding me on the trash <laughs> along 435 and we don't have that trash in kansas i, was, I, t I assured her she did <laughs> but i wonder if those jayhawkers aren't coming over and dumping some of that trash in missouri Anyway, I, I get off, but I, I took a whole page of notes, Becky, and I'm loaded to bear now. So thank you for that presentation. Uh, and then uh, Aisha, I'm glad you stuck around because I, I wanted to tell you, I, I know I, I kind of put you on the spot with my question, but I thought you gave an excellent answer. And uh, I want you to know that we do value you and all the employees and just know that this group up here gets it. And uh, and Terry said it, we got your back and we do. And we really feel like we're in a battle right now, a, a real battle with, with folks across the street and uh, maybe a uh, public awareness battle, a PR battle that uh, we feel like we're losing sometimes, but we're not gonna give up. And so, uh, the message I'd have you take back is just that. We're not going to give up, and we're, we're going to stick with this thing. We're going to take care of our employees. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Waters. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to be brief because everything I was going to talk about has been hit on as, as normal, but uh, there is one thing that had not been hit off. I want to thank the staff. Patrick uh, mentioned earlier, you know, all you salaried people out there and for all the – the extra time that you put in, it doesn't go unnoticed and when we really appreciated it. So we, you guys are great. Everybody salaried, 
hourly. They're all great. And, uh, you know, I want a, a big shout out. You know, we had these storms, like you said, it was 70 on Tuesday and we had an inch and a half of snow. We got hit pretty hard in our area. And uh, state did a wonderful, the driver snowplow pushers did a wonderful job of getting the roads cleared quick, especially being almost what, 600 uh, plow drivers short. So it was, uh, it was great. So uh, they did a good job. But anyway, thank you all. Nicole, I will be in touch with Ford as soon as I walk out of this room. <laughs> By God, we didn't take that government buyout. So we're going to do it somehow. So anyway, GM and Chrysler did though. <laughs> I yield back. Thanks for those uh, fine words. <laughs> Uh, as usual, most of the thunder is gone, but um, we are uh, uh, still fighting this thing across the street. But know that we have the uh, governor, lieutenant governor, or got our backs over there. And um, it's exciting. As Terry said, we've been here four or five years, some longer. <laughs> and uh, look at the fight it's taken to get to get that gas tax passed. Uh, we're... I, I'm cautiously confident that that's going to maintain itself. But when it does, it's 500 million a year that we can use around here. So um, before we adjourn, I want to note our next meeting is May 4th, and we'll be here in Jeff City. Do I have a motion and a second to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. <laughs>